Welcome back. Please help me welcome Governor Brown's Executive Secretary, Nancy McFadden. Thank you. Whoa. It's, uh, it's my job to, uh, to quiet the conversation that I know was stimulated by our first panel, which was quite extraordinary. I know I've heard lots of comments, and somebody stopped me and said that they were Googling to try and find the exact right Latin phrase to describe that panel. Um, I sort of thought that, that if there was a television executive in the audience or watching that, that they were conceiving of a new television show with the three of them, Jerry and Richard and Dr. Pachori, and sort of the view for intelligent people. <laughs> it's my pleasure to take us to the next stage of this conference, which is to delve a little bit deeper. We certainly heard a call to action from our first three terrific speakers. Uh, and now we're going to look a little bit more closely at the human and economic impacts of climate change. As we work through the day, we're going to get to those action items and real ideas of solutions that I know that you are all interested to get to. But let's, let's take a look at the impacts. And to do that, we first prepared a video, a short video for you, to give you a visual and a more real sense of what we're talking about when we're talking about climate impacts. Let's take a look. I guess that in good years when we have water, business is good, attitudes are good, uh, uh, crime is down. So, you know, the, the whole attitude of a community changes when it's going through tough economic times. During our drought season, we uh, were feeding uh, about 1,000 families, 800 to 1,000 families every month, which uh, translated into about... Uh, uh, Five to 8,000 people that were, that were being fed. Uh, was everything in there for a uh, Thanksgiving I, I, it is, I think it's reported that about one-third of uh, the community uh, has direct uh, connection to agriculture. So if you have uh, a drought conditions or those kinds of things that impact uh, uh, our economy, you know, that's going to impact everything across the board. It is worthy of serious negotiation, discussion, innovation to try to solve this problem. Now to this country, specifically California, where heat is the story tonight. It is causing terrible problems. Twelve straight days of record-breaking triple-digit temperatures. The hardest-hit area, the state's Central Valley, where the death toll has been rising along with the temperature. In California, emergency departments are already overwhelmed. We are filled to capacity on any given day. Add an environmental crisis such as a heat wave, and that just, we get into meltdown. We have to drop what we're doing and attend the patient with heat stroke because that's a, a medical emergency. So basically, when heat stroke patients come in, we are taken away from the other patients who do need critical care also. My worry is if we have many days of high heat in the Sacramento Valley, say over 105 for a series of days, over 110, that will be inundated, emergency departments within California will not have the capacity to care for people. I had 1,200 and you know, I think 50, and I lost 653, so half the herd, close $70,000. Early freak storm came in. It was a hard financial hit. 
Extreme weather conditions are definitely something that I'm finding are becoming more erratic. Huge storms are harder to predict, it seems, these days. There are a number of instances in which ranchers have lost hundreds of animals um, to extreme weather conditions. There's high wind, 60, I believe 60 miles an hour gust, heavy rain, and they um, were exposed and suffered from hypothermia. In California, we've actually seen quite a bit of really sudden situations like fires, mudslides, floods, in which animals can become quickly displaced. Flames erupt in the hills of Oakland, claiming property, and now tonight, at least 10 lives and the biggest urban fire in California history still burns out of control. The day before the Oakland Hills fire, I was stung by how incredibly warm it was. You could see all of a sudden these winds pick up the flames and the flames started to jump down the hill. And then as the, the fires got larger, the sky became darker and darker to the point but that at the time that we left, the sky, it was like nighttime. I'm going to try to make a stand uh, along Beachwood right now. I'm putting uh, two strike teams along Beachwood. All right. That was a very emotional time. Watching those winds move that fire down the hill was um, really shocking. We hiked up, and when we got to a certain point, um, there were no more homes. All the homes had burned. It was our home. It was where I had, you know, where I was when I had my children, where I raised my family. There was virtually nothing left. Sobering. I know most in this audience don't need convincing that there are real world impacts, but I think that video gave us a great visceral sense of what they are just in certain parts of our state. Throughout the day, we're going to continue to reinforce the science with the impacts and consequences with things that we can do to, as the governor loves to say, mitigate, no, <laughs> and deal with those impacts. Our panel, which I'm going to invite up in a minute, really are experts in being able to talk about real impacts in California and break it down to regions of California, industries in California, communities in California, so we can understand the differences and yet the commonality, that it's real, it's important, and it needs to be addressed. Before I invite our panel up, I want to introduce our moderator. Brian Murphy, who is the Vice President and Chief Claims Officer of Farmers Insurance. That sounds technical, but in reality, Brian is the first person who is sort of the Chief Catastrophe Officer of Farmers Insurance. He's the one that shows up to all of the uber catastrophes that farmers clients deal with, and he's the one that really understands what farmers clients are facing when they're when they're facing real kinds of catastrophes and disasters. Farmers, as well as other insurance companies, have been at the forefront, along with scientists and other kinds of foundations, of assessing climate change impacts, considering the significant risks to property and other insured assets in California. They understand that strong action on this issue makes good business sense. Brian? Please come up to the stage and bring your panel with you. So thank you, Nancy. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, what I'd like to do right now is uh, quickly go through uh, and take this opportunity and share with you what we want to accomplish in the next hour and 15 minutes. So I'll start off with a little bit of a perspective in terms of the insurance industry because, as Nancy says, uh, this is a big deal to us. Um, after that, uh, I'm going to introduce the panel to you. And then after the introduction of the panel, each of our distinguished guests is going to have an opportunity in a 20-minute segment uh, to go through and share their expertise uh, with you. 
At the very end, then, there'll be a short session uh, for question and answers with any member of the panel. And I would remind you to, there's a little card in, in your packet. If you have a question, please write it down. And if you would, raise your hand and somebody will come by and pick up your question. So as Nancy said, I work for Farmers Insurance and uh, I'm responsible for running the claim department and I do get involved in a lot of uh, the catastrophe things as they come up. But uh, climate change is something, you know, that has a direct impact uh, on both our ability to understand the cumulative risks that we're taking on when we insure properties throughout the United States. And then ultimately the impact that that has both on our customers and frankly also on the bottom line. And so I'd just like to share a few statistics with you uh, before I introduce the panel. Uh, and in 2011, near 2011, we had more uh, significant severe weather events than in any time in the last 20 years. Now, climate change isn't going to be made up by one year or two. It's really the trends. But let me share with you some numbers, okay? There were over 20,000 severe weather events. There were over 1,550 tornadoes. And I don't know how many of you have been to a tornado, but when you go there and you see the devastating impact that that has, that's pretty significant. And you don't even have to go far from here just two weeks ago, remember? There were those winds that we experienced in California and also in Utah. But the surprising thing was they were not where they normally were. And that one event, while, you know, in the scheme of things, it didn't seem that significant, that was an event that cost the insurance industry $300 million just from when. So you can see there, you know, the importance of this in terms of what it means, you know, to our customers and also to the insurance industry. And one other way to look at it is, you know, we also look at probabilities. And so, you know, in the, in the business, what we'd say, well, that's a one in 50 year event, or that's a one in a 100 year event, or that's a one in 250 or 500 year event. And I've been in this business for 30 years, and I've experienced four 100 year events. So that gives you a sense that something, something is changing. And that's why the industry is interested in the subject of climate change. So now to the panel. Let me first introduce each of our three distinguished Panelists, and I'll give you an abbreviated introduction because uh, there's a more complete listing of their experiences in, in the materials that you received. Um, let's begin with uh, Dr. Susan Moser, uh, and uh, she leads uh, Suzanne Moser Research and Consulting. And over the past 15 years, Dr. Moser has focused on the impacts and adaptive responses to climate change. She's a research fellow at Stanford University and currently an advisor to the Obama administration on communication around climate change. What we're going to ask her to do is we're going to ask her to break down the science of climate change so to understand exactly how it works and how it affects, more importantly, how it affects California. After Dr. Moser, I'll uh, introduce Dr. Max Aufhammer, an, as an associate professor at UC Berkeley, he, among other distinctions, is a Humboldt Foundation Fellow and serves on the editorial board for, uh, for the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management. And he'll talk about the economic impact of climate change, including the impacts on business, agriculture, tourism, and infrastructure. And our last pan panelist is Dr. Mark Keim, a senior science advisor for the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Kaim is an expert in disaster medicine and has consulted on the management of disasters involving the health of millions of people worldwide. He's, he has received the Distinguished Services Award for his work on the World Trade Center, the anthrax letter emergencies, and Hurricane Katrina. And he will talk about the human health and disaster response as it relates to the events triggered by climate change. So with that, why don't we get started, and I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. Moser. Dr. Moser. Thank you so much, Brian. And if I could ask for a little more local climate change, that would be really great. It's so cold here. I don't know if the rest of you um, feel that way. Anyway, um, thank you so much for that introduction, and uh, good morning, everyone here, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and good morning, California, online. So what I get to do here, as Brian just said, is talk a little bit about the foundation of climate change. What do we know about that? The uh, few 
key take home messages but then really move us into the foundation for what do we know about the physical impacts of climate change and on extremes so with that in mind if I just start here with um, one of the foundational pieces of work in climate science um, and that is the work of one of our own Dr. Charles uh, Keeling from Scripps and what he did starting in 1959 is to look at carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, and what you see here is essentially an iconic curve. It's become really the standard of our field um, where you see the breathing of the planet. You see this oscillating line of the CO2 in the atmosphere. That is plants basically taking up and letting go of CO2 over the course of the year, the annual growth cycle. But you also see that line going up over time. And actually the, what you see now here, um, just moving it one step further, is that at this point in time we're at 390 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. We can look back 800,000 years and at no time over that length of time has CO2 been this high. Now why does this matter? It matters because CO2 is a gas that traps heat. And as you would expect, under a thickening blanket of heat-trapping gases, the temperature of the globe goes up. And so as you see here over the last 100 or so years, in particular over the last 50 years, where those emissions have been, the, the CO2 has been going up in particular, um, you see how the world is warming up. But we have more. This is not all we know. We see mountain glaciers melting the world over. We see sea ice vanishing at accelerating rates. The Greenland ice is melting at faster and faster rates, and that is important because it adds water to the ocean basins, and we see the ocean temperatures rising up. Between those two things, adding water to the oceans and warming the water in the oceans, which then expands, we actually see the sea level, world the world over, rising. Now, if you don't believe that, and believe me, the birds don't read scientific journals, and yet they are responding to all this warming. You see the plants in the spring start to bloom sooner. You see the migrating birds coming sooner, leaving later in the fall. Now, the big question, of course, is, is it us or is it nature that's doing that? And the consensus view, I want to underline that, the consensus view of the international scientific community is that it is us. We have chemical evidence, we have physical evidence, we have evidence from the patterns over time and space how the earth is warming, that it is our activities, burning fossil fuels like coal, natural gas, um, and deforestation, which adds more of these heat-trapping gases to the atmosphere. It's a detective game that we have played, especially in response to the kind of skepticism that Governor Brown earlier mentioned, and we have just simply ruled out every other reason. That doesn't mean natural variability has gone away. It's simply on top of the underlying trend that you have seen earlier. Oops. Now, what about the extremes? I'm going to uh, just very quickly summarize some of the high-level uh, results from a report that Dr. Pachori earlier mentioned, which is that IPCC report on extreme events and what does it tell us right now. And they have said that with a greater than 90% chance, cold days and nights have declined globally and warm days and warm nights have increased. And in fact, we're seeing this here in the United States where cold extremes have become so rare, they basically heat extremes outnumber the colds by two to one now in the last decade. There's a two, better than two, to, a two out of three chance that coastal high waters along our oceans are going up, that the winter storms are moving north, which would, you, know, you would expect with climate change, and that more regions are experiencing these heavy rainfall events that we just saw in the movie and, um, and that were mentioned earlier. There's lesser confidence just because of the lack of the uh, good data world over, but still that the length of heat waves is going up and that some of the regions are seeing more intense and longer droughts. Now, let me make a really important point here at this juncture. Not every extreme has to become a disaster. Remember this earthquake we had just uh, in 2010? Haiti essentially got flattened. 316,000 people died. It has a, uh, a strength of that earthquake was 7.0. Just six weeks later, there was another earthquake in Chile, much stronger, and only 800 people died. What's the difference? 
You all know this. It's preparedness. It's having building codes. It is enforcing those building codes. It's building better. It's having better response um, systems once you have an emergency and to rebuild faster. That is the difference. In a word, the difference between an extreme event and having a disaster is our vulnerability. And I want to take you through this a little bit more because it's a very important uh, concept in terms of giving us leverage points for intervention to manage these extremes. So say you have one of these extreme events, a heat wave, really high temperatures. Now, the first thing you want to be thinking about is, are you actually exposed to this? Now, you know, those of us here freezing right now might find this really um, hard to believe. But, it, but if you are a worker out in the field, or if you live in poor housing, you don't have much of a choice over that. That is a very important point. The second one is, say it's your elderly mother, or it's your infant, or it's a friend who is already sick. They don't deal a lot very well with a lot more stress from heat. And then the third piece is, how well able are you to protect yourself, deal with the issue, or get to the response emergency systems that we saw earlier? So those three together, they're happening independent of climate change or any, anything. This is something you can do something about, whether it's warming or not, but that makes the difference between a heat wave and actually having a lot of people dying. Now, let me turn to California, what we know here about climate change and how these extremes are changing. The first one, just so I'm going to go through these very quickly. You've heard some of this earlier before. We see the same evidence here in California as we see it throughout the Western United States and um, throughout the U.S. and the globe. The temperatures are going up, of course, with variation year to year, but the trend is clear. You see the sea level rise um, going up. This year, the longest curve actually that we have in the world, the longest continuous record from San Francisco tide gauge, and then superimposed in blue here, the San Diego is a little shorter, but they trend about the same, seven to eight inches or so over the last century. And then we have these other pieces. The, we already was mentioned, more of our precipitation comes as rain than as snow. When it does snow, it melts actually sooner in the spring and runs off sooner. And here, too, the birds don't read the thermometers, and yet they're responding um, to the higher temperatures. And, of course, we do know these extremes, and I'm going to now walk you through the ones that we are most concerned about here in California and see how they change over time. Let me start with temperature extremes. What you see here in this graphic, and I'll walk you through it, is uh, basically a projection forward using models, climate models, and a emission scenario that is basically a business as usual scenario, a higher one. Um, and this one shows the number of extreme heat days that are expected in Sacramento um, in 2050 and to, uh, over time all the way to 2100. And what you see here is what is an extreme heat day in Sacramento is basically defined as something that happens on less than 2% of the uh, days of the year. In this case, it's temperatures higher than 97 degrees. Historically, we've had about four of those on average per year in Sacramento. What you see here is that by the end of, by the middle of the century, it could be 40. And by the end of the century, if we follow this trajectory, 90 of those days. Now, let me move you to this one. Imagine we actually got our act together and we went up a much lower emission scenario. What you see here is that we basically could end up with half that number by the end of the century. Now, the important piece here that I want to make is that it really illustrates why we need, it's not an argument between either or mitigation or adaptation. It is, we want to be on that lower curve because it is just unbearable to have three months worth of those kind of hot days. And yet, we're going to see 30, 40 days of that happening per year. We're going to have to deal with the impacts. Those are already basically in the box. So, in any event, you need both. It's a complementary approach. Let me move to the next one here, which is something you're probably going to hear more about from Mark Keim, um, which is warm nights. In Sacramento, what is defined as sort of an extremely warm night is 61 degrees. Right now, we would probably be happy if it were 61 degrees here. And during the night, that is, during the night, that is not um, a very um, cool night. During the night, you would want to sleep much cooler. Anyway, very difficult for human health to deal with that. And we see those numbers go up from about four, again, historically, to 140. 140. That's four and a half months of really bad sleep, no relief at night, really cranky people, if you ask me. 
That, of course, also has very strong impact on agriculture, and I'm not just going to use this here as a, as a tip to pointing to Max's uh, presentation. You're going to hear a lot more about that uh, shortly. Now, one of the surprising findings about um, this in our study so far is that while we're going to get more of these extreme hot summers in California, the cold snaps are not going to go away. As late as the 2060s, we could still see fewer, but still as extreme Januarys as any historically. So don't give away your mittens, okay? Um, now, let me turn to extremes in water. In this case, not enough. Um, in California, talking about not enough water means talking about the snow, snowpack. And what you see here is a graphic that just shows how much snow is there left on April 1st, which is sort of a, a key date for water managers. And what you see here over time is that by 2050, there could be only two-thirds of the sort of the average that we've had in recent history, and by the end of the century, only a third of the snow of the water in the snow left in this state. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to have enough water, that by itself. What that means is our ultimate storage, which is the snowpack, is basically declining, and that poses much greater challenges for um, water management over time because you have to essentially you know, let that water go. Um, rains are falling, reservoirs are rising, they're not endless, so basically you're going to let it go during the winter rains, and that causes us more trouble with, um, obviously, flooding. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the issue, this is not the whole story. What you have at the same time is that the dry summer months are lengthening, um, and because you had the runoff much sooner, and the demand for water is going up. So balancing all those issues out that I just threw out on the table is the biggest challenge for water managers, and so we need to figure out how to do that. That is the challenge of adaptation. Earlier snowmelt, drier season, and more heat is, of course, the recipe that gets us to wildfire. So let's look at that. And I'm going to walk you through this graphic here um, briefly. What you see here is the outputs of three different um, models. They range from the one on the left being sort of a wetter climate model, and the one on the uh, uh, far right is a drier model with one in the middle. And essentially what you see here is, again, using that higher emission scenario, that the drier our climate will be, the drier and hotter, the more area is at risk of burning. And the bottom line is this. By the end of the century, we could see the area at risk of burning quadruple over what we've seen historically. We're already seeing that the fire season is lengthening and that some of those really big fires like the Oakland one or earlier seasons in, in uh, the 90s in southern Sierra just become more frequent over time. So this is at the same time um, where, as we see the droughts and all the consequences, we're seeing this increase. Let me turn to coasts and flooding. I want to walk you through this graphic. This is, again, that sea level rise curve for San Francisco that I showed you earlier. And what you see here is a red line that indicates that long-term trend. But, of course, you know, sea level doesn't rise like that straight line. That's just math. That's just the average between them. What happens along the way is a squiggly line, and that is the variability from year to year. And what we do know is that the highest of our... Uh, uh, coastal floods have been associated with those events that you see here, the El Ninos. That's when we get flooding, that's when we get beach erosion, that's when we get um, the cliffs fall, the, the houses falling off the cliffs. Now, one thing that's clear is that if the baseline is rising, you don't need a huge El Nino to cause the same kind of damage, right? So let me just put this one here, this little error. Imagine sea level had not risen. And we would have still the same sea level as we had in 1900, and you would have that same um, El Nino that we had in 1997. That basically would cause a little peak. You would barely notice. People probably would say it was a bad season for surfing. It doesn't even show up. But this, the baseline is rising. And so basically, if the El Ninos occur in the same sort of magnitude as they occur on a, on a rising uh, baseline, you get higher and higher flooding, more frequently, more severe. It doesn't have to change the storms themselves, it's just the rising baseline. Seven inches over that time was the difference between a bad day of surfing and having havoc on our coast. 
Now, let me then turn to how is that baseline changing? And here you see the projections, again, from that little squiggly line on the left moving forward. Um, and it's a very wide fan, depending on which scenarios we're using and what methods of, of assessing that. But basically what you're seeing is a range of somewhere between 29 and 75 inches between now and 2100. Um, that is a huge range, and the reason why, why we have that big range, it's actually expanding over the last few years of research, is because we don't fully understand how the ice sheets are going to respond to rapid warming, poking them with a stick, if you will. But what we can say for sure is that, at minimum, if we end up at the lowest end of this range, that that sea level rise over the coming century is about four times faster than it has been over the last century. So not just seven inches, but 29 inches at the minimum. And that's if we get away lucky. I want to just add one more word here about what's, what we have improved in the recent studies, round of the uh, studies, and that is to add to these projections uh, much better topographic information of the coast. We've basically um, have done much better mapping. And so now we can actually see where in the landscape is that water going. This is just a view here of uh, the East Bay, and you're going to hear more about that later. The point of it is we are actually improving our scientific basis for emergency planning, for infrastructure planning, and so forth. Let me go to inland flooding for a second. And for this, I want to start with this graphic here, which is a map of the U.S. showing the uh, rainfall totals over a three-day period. Um, and what you see when you look at just the red dots is that in California, we get as big of storms as just anywhere in the country, in particular in hurricane country, where you can get in three days something like 20 inches of rainfall. So where does that go? Well, um, those big events, those big rainfall events, are associated with something that we call atmospheric rivers. And I'm going to show you this in, in this little map that you see here um, on the slide. What you see is basically the Pacific Ocean Basin um, with uh, California's coastline on the right, sort of just where that little white box is um, touching the black uh, continent. So what you see here is this river, this river feature in the atmosphere. And basically what it is is an, a narrow band of very high concentration of moisture. They can hold as much as Mississippi can hold <laughs> um, or the Amazon. It's an enormous amount of, of rainfall. And in California, we get about... 35 to 45% of our rainfall from storms that barrel over the Pacific on that, on that um, uh, atmospheric river, basically, and dump then our water over us. Now, let me show you what happened. Oh, let me just go back here for one second and simply say that what we know from model projections is actually that these episodes, when those the storms come over the Pacific uh, via these atmospheric rivers, that in model projections, they're expected to actually increase in frequency, carry more water, and happen over a longer season. So that means that the flood hazard season is expanding. You have to worry about floods for much longer of the year. One of the things we're already seeing this in the uh, record, you see here one graphic of, of the American River, which goes through Sacramento, and the peak events, the peak runoff event, flooding events, essentially, have all occurred since 1950. Um, and during uh, in the Central Valley, what we have noticed in other studies is that basically levee breaks are typically associated with those types of events. So what I'm t trying to tell you here is that essentially the areas that are currently flood prone will just continue to be flood prone and actually their risk is going up over time. And we see then, of course, the impacts that you saw in the movie and that Max and uh, Mark are going to talk about more to people in our economy. So we're next. Let me just stop here for a moment and say I've run you through a pretty bad disaster movie. Um, and, you know, you're probably ready to um, go next door. <laughs> I wish I had that for you. Um, but... That's, you're here to actually get fired up to do something about this. So I want to actually ask you to stay with me for just a couple more minutes um, on uh, um, just why it's urgent that we act. What you see here is um, the basically over time the total global carbon dioxide emissions that the world has put out. And you see the black dots. 
What you see in these uh, colorful lines is projections of moving forward. These are based on the IPCC scenarios. And what basically the red dots here is the path that we have actually taken. In other words, we are actually tracking the highest of the emission scenarios that the IPCC is putting out. That's the one that leads to about 11 degree Fahrenheit of warming globally on average. Not something where we're going to go. In order to change course and not go there, which is really the job of all of us here in this room and, and the world over, is that we need to change course. And I love what uh, Ron Sims, the long-term King County ex executive, um, had to say about this. He's now deputy director for HUD. He said, the future ain't what it used to be, but it doesn't have to overwhelm us. Let's not create a future where people look back at us with disdain. This is all part of the grand American tradition of passing on a future that is better than the past. I don't know what gets you up every morning, but what gets me up is that we only have one of these. We don't really have a choice. This is not something we can procrastinate on. So what it will take is those two Latin-rooted words. Um, one on the front end of the problem to reduce global warming overall and reduce the energy we're putting into the atmosphere, the energy that will fuel those extreme events. And on the back end, we need to actually adapt, we need to prepare, we need to reduce our vulnerabilities. And between those changes that are coming and the efforts we're putting into those responses, I think that difference is whether there is going to be harm or opportunity um, in the future in California. I want to end here with a thank you not only to all the scientists that have helped put this talk together or gave me information to, for it, but I want to actually end with an offer to you. You don't have to face this challenge alone. These folks here live in your communities. They are your neighbors. Some of us are a little geeky, and we're learning to speak your language, but we're ready to help. Thank you. Real nerdy scientist, I'm going to use the podium. Uh, my name is Max Alfhammer. I have the great privilege of serving on the faculty at the world's greatest public university uh, in the East Bay over here. Uh, before I start, thank you. Uh, before I start uh, talking about what I was charged with is uh, we've been speaking about consensus. Uh, there is no doubt that warming is, is happening. Uh, Studies funded by the entire spectrum have shown that it's warmer. Even a study funded by the Koch brothers, which was uh, widely cited, has shown that it's warm just as much as the IPCC has said. So that debate is simply over. Uh, the other thing I wanted to state is, do I worry about climate change and denial? I do. It's a very fragile river system that will be subject to climate change and suffer, suffer severely uh, from it. So. Uh, what I'm going to do now is not talk about what's going on in Egypt, but I'm going to talk about are the impacts of extreme events uh, partially due to climate change on California. So if I may have my slides, please. Uh, what you want to worry about extreme weather event events is where they happen, right? If they happen somewhere where there's simply nothing there, it's not going to affect many of us. However, we all know that we live in a state where there's lots of things that are very valuable and beautiful, some of which are traded in markets, others aren't traded in markets, that if these extreme events affect these systems and assets that have mo lots of us moving here uh, are threatened, we have huge economic impacts. So I'm going to walk you through some of these and how they're affected by these different uh, extreme events going forward. Uh, a picture you've seen a lot and a picture that's been alluded to several times uh, in the first panel and again now is that we're seeing that global losses from weather disasters are rising. There's this NOAA statistic that was cited several times. And what you want to think about here is we learn about the amount of damage done mostly from insurance payouts, right? Reinsurance companies pay out after your house burns down or is, is flattened by some other disasters, and that's the sort of dollar amount that we put to the books plus costs for disaster response. 
Uh, if somebody doesn't have insurance and we know the house fell down, we can add that to the total. Is that a realistic or even adequate measure of what economic damage is from extreme events is? Uh, definitely not. There are lots of things that are destroyed that have tremendous amounts of economic value uh, affect overall ecosystem stability that don't have a dollar uh, value placed on them in markets and are not captured in these statistics. So if we lose one of those beautiful California beaches that we like to uh, recreate on, uh, that I don't have to pay a dollar amount to get access to, if that beach disappears, that is a significant economic loss. So what I'm saying here is that these figures may understate significantly the, the damages from uh, extreme weather events. So let me talk about some examples. I only have 17 minutes, so I'm going to just touch on these topics. If you would like more information, uh, this is the outcome of a big uh, research project of 100-plus scientists funded by the peer program of the California Energy Commission, so I'm glad to get you in touch with these scientists. So what we're thinking about Current day, let's not tell stories about end of century. What you're seeing on the left here is a map from the last U.S. Census of where Californians live. If it's red, lots of Californians. If it's green, fewer Californians. What you have on the right side here is a map that shows you fire hazard severity zones. If it's red, very likely of having a wildfire. If it's white, not so likely of having a wildfire. If we take the intersection of the two, way, lay one map on top of the other, a recent statistic states that 40% of California's housing stock is either in high or very high risk uh, fire areas. So there's a tremendous amount of value at risk here from fire in the current day. If we take this forward to the end of the century, and Susie just showed this map to you, think about projections of population growth. The state is so beautiful, people keep on moving here, right? Uh, so where people live, where they built their homes matters, and where this fire risk goes up due to exogenous climate change here uh, is going to determine where the damages will take place. So if lots of people move to the northeastern part of the, the state, for example, those are very high-risk uh, fire zones and will lead to higher economic damages by end of century than we had before. So the point I'm trying to make here is that both existing and future housing that's not built yet will be at a higher risk of, of fire and therefore increase the uh, asset value at risk here. Uh, are fires just going to affect our houses? Well, there are indirect effects of wildfires. So if we think that climate change is going to drive up both the intensity and frequency of these wildfires, many of you who've seen wildfires firsthand realize that they don't just burn things, they emit a tremendous amount of air pollution. So these are high pollution events where we often downwind from these wildfires, see concentrations that we haven't seen in many, many years for very short periods of time. What this leads to is not just highly sensitive populations to air pollution being affected, having, uh, in the worst case scenario, dying from it, or uh, in, in milder scenarios, just having a bad asthma day, but you're going to affect populations that are usually not so sensitive to air pollution, leading to huge amounts of health damages, uh, missed days of school, missed days of work, and also uh, longer run consequences of health for these individuals and strain on the emergency uh, response system in California. Uh, if we go on and talk about another sector that worries about fire risk, uh, we all, I see everybody here, half of you are on your cell phones right now. Uh, the, the thing that happens is you plug those into your wall and you charge them. So we're very dependent on electricity, which we're increasingly producing uh, using renewables. But if we take the same fire probability map from earlier, and you're seeing this in the left-hand panel here, and overlay that fire probability map on current day uh, the current day California grid, what you're seeing here is that significant parts of California's grid are in high and very high uh, fire probability areas. So if a fire happens, a transmission line could be affected by either having ash deposited upon it or it could get warmer and become less efficient at transporting uh, electricity or in a worst case scenario, it will fail and we've experienced this several times in recent memory. If you're looking at the right panel here, this is a, a map of California's major transmission infrastructure. I apologize for the highly scientific map here, but I'll, I'll put it in simple terms. If it's red, that 
uh, transmission line will be at about a 70 to 80 percent risk of being affected by a wildfire in a given year. Now, what you're seeing here is that in the very north here, that's a transmission line that brings in a tremendous amount of electricity from our northern uh, neighbors. There are also some transmission lines in the east which also bring in tremendous amounts of electricity from our neighbors. So if these transmission lines are negatively affected during wildfire episodes, which often happen to be times when the grid is already being put under strain because it's often very hot and we're cooling our homes, uh, this will have tremendous direct consequences in your inability to charge your cell phone or, more importantly, uh, to fuel California's uh, companies in their quest to produce the goods and services that we and the rest of the world uh, demand. So that's the, the transmission line. Let me move on to another type of stress here, which is just heat. Let's step away from fire. What do you do when it's hot? If you live in San Francisco, nothing. You go outside and you enjoy the weather and you have some delicious ice cream. If you live in El Centro, you turn on your air conditioner on high. So the notion here is across the state, what we do during hot days uh, depends on, on how often it gets hot. In El Centro, it's hot all the time, so almost everybody has an air conditioner. In San Francisco, almost nobody does. But during hot days, we consume a lot of electricity, and most of that electricity goes to cooling both homes as well as commercial and industrial facilities. So what you're seeing here is the relationship between load and the California Independent Systems Operator Grid and uh, temperature, and there's a steep increase during extreme heat days in the amount of electricity being uh, consumed in the system. Now, this is important. I want to link this to something that Susie said earlier. What she showed in plain words in extreme heat days is your whole summer by the end of the century, if we are on the current emissions trajectory, will look like the worst five days. The worst five days at the end of the summer will be much hotter than the current worst five days. Translating this into electricity uh, load, what this means is we're essentially going to have peak load conditions all summer instead of having it during three to four days of summer. This has tremendous consequences for capacity planning, uh, both in transmission as well as generation, but it's something we have to keep in mind. Uh, If we translate this into what many of you care about uh, very much is household consumption. So this here is uh, a project that we did with a collaboration with California's investor-owned utilities who provided us access to anonymized electricity bills. I would love to know how much electricity Governor Brown consumes, but I can't look that up in my data because there are privacy concerns, so I don't know how much electricity you consume. Uh, Very little. See, see, very little. Excellent. Uh, (laughs) But what I'm showing you here are looking at the household level what the response during hot days is in electricity consumption and how that varies across states. So the bottom right map here shows that by the end of century, under this A2 scenario, this somewhat pessimistic but realistic, unfortunately, scenario of emissions, Households in the Central Valley and households in the southeastern part of the state are expected to increase their electricity consumption by uh, 60% roughly. In terms of overall increase of residential electricity consumption, that's a 50% increase. That does not count that people in San Francisco that did not own air conditioners before uh, may actually go out and buy them. That also does not count in uh, Commissioner Rosenfeld right here, who's going to continue uh, trying to move us towards more efficient air conditioners and, and better homes that keep the heat in when it's supposed to stay in and keep the heat out when it's supposed to stay out. But this provides an, an order of magnitude how big some of these uh, effects are. Just briefly, uh, power plants are negatively affected by heat, too. They become less efficient at peak temperatures. So during an extreme heat day, a uh, natural gas-fired power plant is about 4 to 6 percent less efficient. So we produce less electricity per unit of, of natural gas during the times when we need electricity most. And also the transmission network becomes less effective at transmitting electricity during these extreme heat days. So when we're thinking about this increased frequency of extreme heat days, we're getting worse at generating electricity during the times when we need electricity the most, 
And that increase in demand is so significant that that factor, climate change, really has to be taken into account when we're thinking about capacity and transmission planning. The other thing we, of course, have to think about is we're building a lot of new extensions uh, of the grid in order to get those renewables online. So where those extensions go and what, how that interacts with fire risk is also an, an interesting question we should be concerned about. Agriculture. I'm from Germany, uh, which explains the bad sense of humor. But the, uh, <laughs> every time I go back, I do enjoy the potatoes, but I can't wait to come back here to enjoy California's wonderful uh, produce. Uh, I live in, in Walnut Creek now, so there's lots of good cherries out there in that direction. But the point I'm trying to make here is California's agricultural sector is going to be significantly and negatively impacted by climate change. This is some recent very nice work by a former, former Berkeley graduate, two former Berkeley graduates right here, who show that during periods of extreme heat, this is for America's major field crops, we see significant losses in yield at these extreme heat days. So during the growing season, you don't need the whole summer to be extreme heat. You just need a doubling of the number of days of extreme heat, and you get significant losses in yields. It doesn't just affect how much you produce per acre, it also affects quality. So for those of you who like table grapes or like to consume grapes in their fermented bottled form, uh, <laughs> California's ability to produce the world's finest wines will certainly be affected by climate change because the microclimates that give rise to these wonderful grapes that we bottle is going to be affected by this and affect the quality of this, uh, of this wine, which clearly has economic impacts for that uh, community. Let's talk about sea level rise. I have about five more minutes. Uh, Susie already set this up very nicely. I just want to give you some ideas of what this means. So if we get about a four-foot rise in sea level, which is about uh, a uh, mean uh, prediction of, of what we're thinking is going to happen, if you put a storm surge on top of that, surfers love storm surges, planners don't, okay? So what you see here is a storm surge by end of century and what this means for flooding for the Bay Area. There are certain areas of the Bay Area that are economically important that for brief periods of time but still may be significantly affected by these storm surges. So what you see here is SFO, you see Oakland International Airports, both of which are under water. Again, it's important to keep in mind what we can do to prevent this. There are clearly things uh, in the adaptation front that you can do, uh, build bigger levees or something like that in order to protect that from happening. But it has to be taken into account when we start planning for these scenarios. In terms of economic impacts, I'm sure Sir Richard Branson would have something to say if, if this were a, a, a free, more frequent state. And this will also affect the overall global network of airlines planning for where airline, uh, airplanes go in the long run. Okay, uh, this is Silicon Valley, uh, just showing you where the water would be during one of these storm surges. So this will affect both uh, our uh, real estate down here, lots of which is, is commercial, as well as our transportation infrastructure highways, which are in these areas. Now, the... Other sector that we really have to think about, power plants are not only at risk from this notion that uh, it gets hotter and they become less efficient. Lots of our natural gas-fired power plants, we don't have any coal-fired power plants in the state of California, uh, lots of our natural gas-fired power plants are in areas which are at risk from these storm surges. So they're in areas where if we get sea level rise and we get a big storm, uh, they may be at risk from being, having their property flooded or being affected. Again, this is not a Hollywood scenario where all these power plants will all of a sudden stop functioning, but we have to take into account in terms of where we put new power plants and what we do to our existing power plant infrastructure to plan for what is coming our uh, way here. Storing large quantities of irrigation water uh, is very expensive. Right? Fortunately, we have a natural built-in storage system, which is the Sierra Snowpack, which delivers, stores snow and then over the season delivers irrigation water, which gives rise to all the beautiful California agricultural output and allows us to, uh, to water our homes and lawns and so on. But the notion here is under climate change, during extreme drought events, these snowpacks may become much smaller and it may be much 
more difficult to deliver the irrigation water throughout the uh, season by end of century than it currently is. Why does this matter to an economist? Uh, this matters to an economist because irrigation water we use to grow agricultural crops. We grow lots of them. We grow fine ones. It takes people to do this. So a recent paper I've authored with a colleague here shows a strong positive correlation between agricultural water deliveries and agricultural employment. A 90% shortfall in irrigation deliveries from the state and federal systems we've shown uh, led to a 5,000 job, uh, 5,000 jobs lost during one season, most of which uh, we can explain through changes in, in area planted. So there are significant economic uh, impacts here. I don't want to talk much about the extreme, extreme events, but just to give you an idea, uh, disaster planners do these scenarios where they plan for the perfect storm. This is actually a perfect storms scenario right here, where California gets hit by multiple of these atmospheric rivers in rapid sequence, which would lead to wind speeds, flooding, and amounts of rainfall uh, we haven't uh, seen in a, in a very, very long time. But just to give you an idea of an order of magnitude, uh, this event was estimated, and this is a peer-reviewed paper, to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars of damages. So these extreme, extreme, very low probability events can lead to huge damages, a flavor of which we got during uh, Hurricane Katrina. Now, come to California. I came here uh, in, in uh, when did I come here? 1998, it's been a long time. We came to California for its natural beauty, its pristine beaches, its uh, amazing economy. And uh, climate change and extreme events are certainly putting stressors and some of these resources at risk in the, uh, in the long run here. So how the tourism uh, industry is going to be affected by this is also something we should be uh, thinking about, although it's hard to quantify the numbers here. This all comes down to something, right? What's the cost of this going to be? I'm not going to put a dollar number on this, but the concept here is pretty simple. There's the cost of doing nothing versus the cost of doing something. You know you're going to get older, right? Do we plan for old age? Well, you should. I do, right? It's the rational thing to do. So what I do is I plan for old age in order to make sure I can deal with the extreme events that happen in older age. Uh, in the best way possible, but it takes planning and action now, right? It takes eating right, exercising, and expending some money to plan for these events in the future to make sure they don't have the disastrous impacts. Finally, last and not least here, there is a common misconception which uh, this environmental economist has been talking to his undergrads for years, but I will talk to you about it uh, now which is this notion that there's a trade-off between environmental quality and the economy, right? You can have one or the other. You can't have both. The environment is not a Gucci handbag or a very fancy watch. It's not a luxury good. In fact, there's some very recent evidence here that during extreme heat days, the productivity of California workers decreases significantly. Uh, there's also recent empirical evidence using data, not assumptions or anything like that that shows that higher po pollution events make California's workers less productive. Uh, indirectly through climate change, we will have more extreme heat days and we will have more pollution days. So there's a direct link between the productivity of the workers in California and uh, climate change here. So I'm finished. They're already waving. You're over time here. I wanted to uh, thank you very much for, for listening to me, and I look forward to the discussion. Well, it's my pleasure to join you today uh, here at, uh, in California. Um, could I have my uh, presentation, please?
So I'm going to talk to you about uh, disaster risk reduction. So making a transition on not only those impacts, but now what can we do about them? So it's a great transition for the af- towards the afternoon as well. And I'm going to talk about this as a sustainable adap- adaptation or uh, adaptatus, I believe would be the uh, correct pronunciation this morning. <laughs> Um, but the idea here is that if we're talking about disasters over a period of time of 100 years, 200 years of increased frequency, the model that we've used in the past will no longer apply and no longer be efficient. We as Americans shouldn't anticipate that we can sustain a model for a disaster response that increases um, every year over the next 200 years. Uh, we, at, uh, over the past 10, 15 years in America, have been trying to sustain a model for preparedness and increasing in public health, and I can tell you that over the past four years, we've cut that uh, funding now by over one-third. I don't have to tell my public health colleagues um, of how the uh, preparedness programs have been uh, slashed uh, recently. So it's very difficult for the richest nation in the world to sustain a model for disaster response, and I would propose to you that we can no longer sustain the idea that we can withstand future hurt. King Katrina's one, two, five, or ten. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what we can do about that. How can we frame this discussion in a way where we can um, analyze it better and then start making real impacts that not only focus on disasters, but also have co-benefits, co-benefits, co-benefits for the environment, co-benefits for society, and also for other things like business and reduction of poverty. So we, we've heard before that uh, uh, obviously the reports from IPCC, I was just a, a, um, uh, a special editor for the uh, IPCC report now on exposures, and we come to this conclusion, of course, that global climate change will increase the probability of extreme weather events, and this is not new. Um, and then I want to break this into two uh, sort of uh, general categories for you to, uh, for our discussion today. One is high pre- precipitation events and the other low precipitation events. So easy uh, way to sort of characterize these. High precipitation involving storms, floods, landslides that come with these high precipitation, as well as low precipitation disasters, of course, heat, drought, and wildfire. And we can see future trends in extreme weather events. As a matter of fact, we're already at CDC and my group in particular doing disaster response and preparedness throughout the world. We are responding to these events now. Um, Many of them are actually attributable to climate change, as I'll talk about. Um, These can be broken down, as I mentioned, in drought, uh, heat waves, heavy precipitation, cyclones, and sea level rise. But now drought has other complicating factors as well. As we recently saw in Texas, drought results in wildfires, uh, increased pollution, as well as crop failures, heat waves, tremendous numbers of heat illness, large numbers of life, uh, loss of life. In Europe, for example, 30,000 upwards to 80,000 in the newest estimates of people that have lost their life in one heat uh, wave uh, throughout Europe. Those are tremendous burdens upon uh, modern societies now. Heavy precipitation events, we see the storms, uh, inland flooding, and also landslides as well that are increasing throughout the world. I've responded to several of those in the region. Also, cyclones and the storm surge that, uh, that uh, Max uh, pointed out earlier, the storm surge is responsible for over 90% of cyclone-related deaths. So that's the real killer. When it comes to cyclones and hurricanes, it's not the wind that kills people, it's the water that kills people. And I would propose to you as well, if people drown during the hurricane itself when the wind is still blowing, no response in the world the next day. No amount of response, whether it comes from the local community, the state level, or the federal level, will bring those people back. And so I have a little problem with the word resilience. I say resilience is for survivors. What we need to be thinking about is preventing people from becoming exposed to these hazards so that they don't die to begin with. Resilience is for the mother and father that have already lost their children that must get on with their lives, or or the child that has lost their parents because of that. So I think the more humane approach to this is to prevent people from becoming exposed, prevent people from becoming victims. We We may, in fact, prevent some of the hazards, not all of them. In those hazards that we can't prevent, we can prevent people's exposures. We can prevent people's susceptibility, and I'll talk more about that. In addition, I'd also like to point out this issue of sea level rise and coastal flooding that occurs with that, crop failures, as well as population displacement, because I think not only in California are you going to see more effects of this, but you'll also see immigration coming from the Pacific from this. And I want to point this out because this is a photograph and is very important to me. Sea level rise events and disasters are already occurring, and they have been for years. 
And this is a particular paper that I wrote in 2006 where I was asked to, um, as part of a FEMA assessment, go to the Pacific Islands in Micronesia. And what we documented there was a sea level rise event that uh, was creating starvation in the Pacific. Idyllic Pacific Islands where life is easy, food plentiful, and starvation events are already occurring because of sea level rise. Not only one, but since that period of time, over 27 of these events have been uh, uh, documented in the Pacific. In this particular island here, the top photograph is a photograph of a large communal taro field in the center of the island. Most of the food from the island itself comes from this carbohydrate source. Uh, this particular uh, wave came over the island, very small wave, not a damaging wave, only about a foot tall, was gone in about uh, an hour, an hour and a half, and left behind salt in the soil. It poisoned the soil of the, of the island itself. This photograph that you see here is all mud left over now from what used to be a very productive field that fed the entire island. It also killed most of the breadfruit trees that are responsible for much of the carbohydrate uh, energy as well for these people. And by the time that we got there, they were literally eating rotten taro and eating the leaves off of the trees. And this is in Micronesia. And what we predict is we'll see more of these events occurring throughout the Pacific. There's some talk in the Pacific Islands about people that say, well, you know, people should immigrate to higher ground. But what what we'll see in our generation and probably in our children's generation is people starving, world food problems in the Pacific Islands as a result of people that hold on to the last thread of their existence in their own home countries. When you move out of your own home country, now you become a refugee in a different nation and you lose, as mentioned earlier, the social, the uh, cultural um, treasures and traditions as well. This young man here was pulling up a piece of taro that normally you would have to cut through with a, with a saw to get through. He was literally, it was so rotten, he was reaching into the ground and able to pull it up with one hand. And these were the kinds of food that these people were eating by the time that we arrived there. So the public health uh, impact of these extreme weather events, one of the things that we want to point out is between 1970 and 1999, climate-related hazards accounted for 90% of all global disasters. So really the burden of disasters has always been related to the climate and still continues to be so. And the other thing that I think is a very important to recognize, and I hope that we can, I can impress this upon you now, is that the world's poor are disproportionately affected by climate, uh, by um, um, disasters in particular, not only uh, uh, climate-related disasters, but even seismic disasters, earthquakes, and so on. Uh, one of the um, uh, leaders of the uh, disaster uh, response organization for the UN once said, disasters seek out the poor and bind them in their poverty. And it makes no difference whether you're a poor country or the poor within a rich country. The poor are the ones that carry the burden of disasters. Take a look back at the disasters that you've seen in your recent, uh, in our recent past. Katrina was a perfect example of the poor being mostly affected. And so when we talk about this issue of increasing numbers of hazards, I want to focus you today on the aspect of the increasing vulnerability Disasters seek out those most vulnerable in our society, and they seek out the soft underbelly of public health, and that's where they show our weaknesses. And so we many times have to address these underlying causes in order to be able to long prepare and prevent these disasters in the long term. So this is a list of, uh, pu- of uh, the re- published in 2008 of the public health consequences of extreme weather disasters. And you can see that many of them, obviously, we would uh, understand, of course, of deaths, injuries and illnesses, but also other things that may not necessarily uh, uh, come to mind at first when we talk about disasters, worsening of chronic illnesses. And, and overseas, many of the deaths that occur in disasters in, in developing world occur as a direct result of the disaster. But here in the United States, many times, the majority of deaths from disasters are actually worsening of chronic diseases. People have heart attacks, strokes, and so on. Uh, People have worsening of emphysema, uh, of COPD, and so on. And other aspects as well of public health issues, of course, loss of shelter, clean water, sanitation, safe food, and so on. Loss of public services, public risk perception goes up. People perceive that the state and the the nation is less able to protect them. There's a perception of risk that becomes pervasive. 
In addition, increased pests and vectors in our country. Luckily, most of those pests and vectors do not spread disease. And as well as the possibility of toxic exposures being carried by floodwaters, being carried in the air during uh, uh, fires and so on as well. So these public health consequences of extreme weather events, we can expect them to increase when we start talking about climate change. If extreme weather increases, then obviously the public health burden increases. If the public health burden increases, obviously profits go down, more burden on the insurance companies, more burden on the, on the uh, health systems themselves. And one is, once again, a rather inhumane approach to uh, being able to protect the health of uh, the people themselves. Now, uh, bear with me. I can't come to you from CDC without uh, bringing you an overly busy um, table. I'm here from the, I'm from the federal government, and I'm here to help. Uh, but I wanted to show you just a very simply in this far left uh, uh, column here the public health impacts that I just showed you. Uh, going starting from deaths, injuries, loss of clean water, all the way down to food scarcity at the very bottom. And uh, it color-coded here to simplify things, red is bad. Uh, and uh, it took me uh, many years of college to be able to, to, to translate that for you. Um, red and yellow, of course, orange uh, being, uh, red and orange being the worst and the green being the best. And so I want to point out that when we looked at the, the, these different columns here, looking at landslides on the far left, all the way over flood, drought, wildfire, and heat, when we talk about the, the real uh, killer, um, the one that can really cre uh, create the largest number of deaths, we have to worry about heat. Um, heat, as I mentioned before, killed tens of thousands of people in Europe in the most recent times. Uh, people in the inner cities are very uh, um, uh, vulnerable to heat. Heat also selects people who are vulnerable within the city. It kills elderly people who have lack of a social network. We know that from the Chicago studies of the Chicago heat wave as well. So you find out that these same people where we're trying to do outreach in many of our other programs, public health, poverty reduction, and so on, they're also most vulnerable to these disasters. In addition, other, other uh, types of things that we need to worry about, um, floods, as you can see, uh, many of the areas in, in, uh, under floods are under orange, uh, large impacts on the infrastructure itself, large amounts of disruption of the populations. I want to point out, though, that even after people return home after floods, there are good studies in UK, former Soviet Union, as well as United States that have looked at the impact of floods, the psychological impact of floods. And what we find is even five years after people move back into their own homes, everything's back, so to speak, as to normal, there are still elevated hormone levels of stress hormones in their bodies. Adrenaline levels are still high chronically five years out, and there's increased mortality. In other words, there's increased possibility of you dying if you've been displaced from your home and you're back in your home. So displacement by itself doesn't mean that you, everything's okay when you, go, when you go back. You're actually more likely to die younger if you've been displaced from your home. So let's keep that in mind when we start talking about minimi minimizing the impact of floods or impacti impacting of, of being displaced from your home because it really does take a toll on your life overall. And uh, I also wanted to point out as well that uh, one of the, the, throughout this um, entire uh, uh, table here as well, the public concern for safety is always very high. So the situational awareness that needs to, be, uh, needs to be accomplished, the amount of briefing that needs to work, the amount of investigation that needs to occur in order to um, uh, either address the fears of the population, allay them, or um, uh, uh, warn them, there's a, a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done during that period of time as well. As I mentioned earlier, small island developing states are, are uh, 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 identified as extremely vulnerable to these events but also coastal communities. Coastal communities, obviously, throughout California, but in addition as well, coastal communities specifically that have the poor, the poor people of coastal communities most, uh, are most severely affected. Those that are dependent upon local food, especially in other areas of the world, areas that are also dependent upon local uh, water supplies. Um, so you can see, obviously, uh, in my experience in the Pacific Islands, that uh, they met all of these criteria, and many of your own communities would do the same as well. I also wanted to point out this issue of climate refugees. You can see a map here of the Pacific uh, estimating that there are elements of, of migration that are, um, uh, that are predicted um, throughout the, the region here. We expect that many of the Pacific Islands over the next 50 years uh, large, uh, will have large waves of population that will be uh, displaced. 
and also as well as you can see along the, uh, the coastline and uh, Central America, Mexico, and up into California as well. You can expect an impact of uh, more people coming to California as a result of losing their homes. Um, and uh, in, not only uh, in California also, but uh, we expect to see the same thing on the other, uh, your other uh, brethren across the sea um, in uh, China and on the Pacific Rim throughout the entire area. We know that disasters are increasing worldwide and they're increasing due to vulnerability. And I'd like to close with this idea of vulnerability, focusing on what we can do to change the vulnerability. We talked about mitigation before. The idea of mitigation is to lower greenhouse gases so that we have less of this warming. But adaptation says, look, we can, even if it stopped today, we still have quite a few of these events we have to adapt to. So how do we adapt? We adapt by lowering our vulnerability. What is vulnerability? It's susceptibility to physical or emotional injury. I took this picture actually um, when I was leading the, uh, response, the HHS response in the Indian Ocean tsunami in Sumatra. And this is a perfect example of the kind of people that don't survive even after a disaster. This is a grandmother and a, a young child, only uh, survivors left alive in that family. And these are the kinds of people that even after the disaster have very low likelihoods of survival. So these ideas of factors of vulnerability, let's break this down as we close. One of them is exposure to the hazard. The hazard itself, hurricane, earthquake, tornado, flood, drought, exposure to that hazard. The second thing is susceptibility to harm. In other words, some people are more susceptible. Over 65 may be more susceptible, 75, 85 even more susceptible and so on. And also as well, resilience. How resilient, what kind of capacity do you have to be able to bounce back? So in other words, we have two other chances before we get to resilience in order to prevent these impacts. We can lower exposures. We can um, lower susceptibility. And then if that doesn't work, then we prepare and respond and hopefully recover. But I would propose to you over the past 10 years, maybe 20 years in the United States, we've been skipping to responding and recovering. Rather than lowering the exposures in an effective way, rather than, um, uh, which is also cost effective and also um, productive. So you can see the mixtures of exposure, susceptibility and resilience all come together to um, um, impact vulnerability. And in a productive way, in a profitable way, we can lower uh, the vulnerability itself. So what I mean by exposure, exposure of people in the area being exposed to the hazard and subject potential losses. In other words, those people living in New Orleans, uh, 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 Louisiana's Ninth Ward, they were right in the exposure itself. The floods came right into their neighborhoods. What about susceptibility? It's the state of being at risk. So, for example, as I mentioned, some people may be more susceptible to heat and so on. But healthy people are less susceptible. So anything we do to promote health, anything we do to promote poverty reduction, we actually lower people's susceptibility to die in disaster because it seeks out the poor, it seeks out the weak, it seeks out the infirm. So everything that you do to build this, the productivity of your society and, and make a healthy uh, population, healthy people, healthy communities, and healthy homes, you're actually lowering susceptibility. And what about resilience? Resilience is living among people that can help you. Resilience is preparedness. It's response and recovery. It's those things we've been talking about now for 10 years. We've done a remarkable job at building resilience in America. I would propose to you that the challenge now is for us to join together and also uh, promote lowering exposures and also lowering the susceptibility of our populations to these types of challenges. So how do we reduce our vulnerability? Disaster reduction everywhere across the world occurs at the community level. Communities can identify the main risks that they, uh, they, they find. As was mentioned earlier, um, you have different types of vulnerability in different areas of the state, some more challenging than others. And community health sectors, community workers, community um, businesses can actually play an active role in reducing susceptibility. Hospitals, clinics, medical outreach, and prevent preventive health services all re produce healthy people. In addition, reducing, reducing exposure by healthy homes and also as well increasing resilience through these healthy communities. So it's an all-inclusive effort that has co-benefits. It's not merely talking strictly about disasters, not really talking strictly about um, climate change adaptation, but it's also talking about um, safe, uh, healthy uh, communities, as well as productivity, increased profits, and reduction of poverty itself.
So in talking about this, I'll give you a closing, a few examples of reducing exposures. Floodplain management. We've done a wonderful job in America of reducing the floodplains, of reducing the flood itself, reducing the hazard and avoiding it completely. We used to have thousands of deaths in the United States due to floods every year, a hundred years ago. Now we have about a hundred a year. It's unheard of and compared to some other countries. In China, we have hundreds of thousands of flood deaths every year. Other population protection measures, many of them related to land use, planning, regulation, construction, and so on. All of these, we in public health need your help across the other sectors to be able to lower the burden of disasters by the way you build our communities. It's up to you. We in public health can only respond and hope to provide the care that's necessary. Also, in, pub and in reducing susceptibility, we can do so by promoting health promoting health care, reducing poverty, reducing disparity of health among the different uh, segments of our population, by planning as communities, increasing social network, as well as public services and uh, community cohesion. And then finally, we can build resistant, resilient communities by improving our preparedness, continuing to prepare for those disasters which we cannot prevent as well as responding to those and hopefully, if we're lucky, recovering from those events in the long term. So climate change adaptation should be seen as a sustainable development. When we build communities, we should be building them for the long term. We should be building new assets for a long uh, 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 investment. And thank you very much. So at the beginning, I promised you a panel of experts. Isn't it great to listen to somebody that can really get into the issue and cover both, you know, what is climate change, what is the economic impact, and then what is, you know, really, you know, what is the human piece. And so I want to thank uh, all of my panelists. Uh, it's one thing on content and intellect and their credentials. It's another one, though, if you can sit in the audience and you can feel the passion that they bring to, to this issue and, frankly, the caring for the planet. So with that, I'd like to thank the panel. We are going to forego the question and answer session, but they'll all be available at lunch, and we really encourage you to ask them questions individually. Uh, but for now, in the interest of time, we're going to forego that. And uh, so let's give our panel one more last. <laughs>